Hi, this video lecture will deal directly with dramatic literature. It's actually going to go over the PowerPoint uh, that you see here. Uh, the PowerPoint for the uh, unit that's also available just as a PowerPoint on Blackboard. So let's go ahead and get started. So dramatic literature is written to be performed, so isn't something lost when we read it silently to ourselves. One of the things I want you to think of is that you need to read these uh, plays that I'm asking you to read out loud so that you get a feel for the language. And whenever possible, I've provided, particularly in this slideshow, uh, copies of the actual play for you to watch. Um, and examine so that you can get a feel for that uh, through watching the play because I believe watching the performance is actually more helpful than just reading it on its own. Uh, what makes dramatic literature unique? It has conventions, customary ways of presenting action, uh, that the use of soliloquies, this is a monologue in which the audience overhears the character's innermost thoughts and they're often uh, the same thing as asides, a line, or speech given directly to the audience. And they're didactic. Dramatic literature very often has a theme or social purpose. So unlike poetry, which very often does not have a theme or social purpose, there are poems that do, uh, but it's not as common uh, as it is with dramatic literature. We're back in the realm of what we were talking about with what is literature and what is literature's purpose. Uh, and dramatic literature is very much a social experience. It, that means it's meant for an audience, which we've already talked about uh, a bit. So because it's meant for an audience, it has this, you'll see in the readings how it has this religious dimension. It has this uh, social dimension in which uh, the playwright will often speak directly to the community about contemporary concerns are universal concerns. The play is often constructed to evoke this theme or message. There's often a moral to the play. So in the classes I've taken where I had the opportunity to write dramatic literature, I was often limited to three characters when I first started. A protagonist, the character the audience is supposed to empathize or sympathize with. A confidant, a character that the protagonist trusts and works with to achieve his or her desired goal and an antagonist, the character that blocks the protagonist's progress or whose goals run contrary to that of the protagonist. And this structure is pretty common throughout the history of uh, the theatrical uh, productions, uh, playwriting, that you'll have a protagonist, a confidant, and an antagonist. The antagonist may actually be a force rather than a character. So the, the force, like in the tragic plays that you're reading in the first section here, the force, of, uh, the antagonistic force might be something like fate or the gods or society's uh, perception of a person. So and, and the antagonist doesn't necessarily have to be a character. So while reading Trifles, I do want you to read Trifles by Susan Glassbell. Try to determine what characters fill each role in the text. Who is the protagonist? Who or what are the antagonists? And these are things that you can discuss in the discussion board. Uh, it's one of the main elements of the play. I want you to see that you can see that you can identify these things. So most dramatic literature can be categorized by whether it is tragedy or comedy. A tragedy portrays the conflict of humanity versus some superior overwhelming force. We will be looking at two tragedies in the critical case book, Sophocles. Sophocles is considered one of the great tra tragedians from uh, authors of tragedies from the classical ancient Greece and Rome time period. His protagonists often must fulfill a terrible destiny which they cannot escape no matter how they try to. So again, these plays are built around the idea that there is a terrible destiny for these characters, and that terrible destiny is actually the antagonist. It's not a particular character in the play, necessarily. Aristotle, an important critic from the classical period, used Sophocles, among others, to develop a definition for tragedy and the tragic hero. And that definition is going to be central 
to the essay that you write for dramatic literature. You're going to write an essay comparing Othello uh, from the Shakespeare play, Othello, the Moor of Venice, uh, to Troy Maxson from the play Fences, uh, which, you know, at the time of the recording of this video, we have a trailer out for a film version of that that's finally coming out. So if you get a chance to go see that film, if, if it is out uh, at the time that we're studying this, that would be fantastic. Or if there's a DVD version of it, you can start looking for that. It's going to have Denzel Washington and Viola Davis in it. So it's going to be fantastic to have that resource finally uh, for us. But we're going to compare and contrast those two characters using this definition for tragedy and the tragic hero. That's the essay. So we need to know what a tragic hero is and experience the tragic hero in the classical sense so we can have something to uh, compare and contrast our, our, our early modern, which is our Shakespearean uh, tragic hero, and our contemporary, which is Troy Maxson from Fences, uh, hero too. So for Sophocles, the plays that he's writing, he's writing in a theater that was both religious and a civic occasion uh, the, for the 5th century Athenians. It was actually part of a festival called the Great Dionysia, which was a festival to the god of wine Dionysus, who's also a resurrection deity. Uh, tied to the seasons. Uh, and so this theater is highly st stylized. Uh, in the next slide, you get a link to Tyrone Guthrie's 1957 film version of Oedipus the King, R. Rex. And you can watch this on the slideshow yourself. We're not going to watch it in my lecture uh, because you can just go directly to the slideshow and watch it. Or you can do a YouTube search and it'll pull it up. Uh, it's actually a translation by William Butler Gates, a very famous uh, poet and playwright. So there's the film itself and I expect you to go through and watch it. Um, and you'll use that to give you an idea of what these early tragedies were like. Oedipus is the tragic hero of that uh, play and so Aristotle when he was developing his concept of tragedy would would watch these plays. He'd actually be in the audience during the Great Dionysia. He'd watch these plays and through that he developed these ideas. So he uses the play itself to create the uh, concept of tragedy. So in translation we get tragedy is an imitation of an action of high importance, complete and of some amplitude in language enhanced by distinct and varying beauties, acted not narrated by means of pity and fear affecting its purgation of these emotions. Now that's a pretty complicated statement. Uh, let me try to break it down to you. The tragedy's main character was its tragic hero. According to Aristotle, the tragic hero needed to have the following qu qualities. It needs to have a tragic flaw, his or her greatest asset, and greatest grief. This is called the homatia, or harmatia. Uh, the tragic hero needs to be of high estate so that he or she could suffer a fall. So in whatever community that hero exists in, they, they need it to be of a higher position so that they could actually fall from that position. Uh, the hero needed to create purgation in the audience, or what Aristotle called catharsis, and that was the release of these negative emotions. Uh, the character must recognize at some point that he or she cannot escape fate and experience a reversal and this is a reversal of a fortune and of fortune and this is the fall that might affect purgation it's that reversal itself that causes the release uh, you can read Antigone on page 1204 and that play is uh, very similar to Oedipus Antigone is a tragic hero as well and that'll give you a better understanding, be looking for these co um, qualities in that play and be using that in the discussion board as well uh, as your examples. So now what? Uh, once you have completed reading the uh, Sophocles casebook, the next thing you need to do is move on to the Shakespeare casebook. In that casebook, the only play you need to read is Othello. 
I do want you to read all the information about the Shakespearean theater and the Shakespearean world. Uh, and I think there's some information in there about the Shakespearean tragedy. But all you need to read is Othello. You don't need to read A Midsummer Night's Dream or Hamlet or whatever else is in that edition. Othello is sufficient. Uh, and then you also need to read uh, Troy Maxson's play Fences. So that's the big part of your reading here. After you've read the two plays, you can look at the next PowerPoint for dramatic literature. And so this is a relatively short slideshow because a lot of the information is in the reading. Um, so it's very important that you do the reading for this, uh, this paper. You know, the reading's been important throughout the semester, but even more so, you need to do the reading for this literature, and you need to take notes on the reading. So once you do start reading uh, Othello, and you start reading Troy Max and Fences, you need to look at specific, specific lines, things people say about the character, or things that the character says about himself, that uh, illustrate these qualities of a tragic hero. Okay, so get started reading those things. Read Sophocles' uh, Oedipus Rex. Read, watch it. Read Antigone. You can find versions of Antigone on YouTube. You can watch that as well. Then read Othello and read Troy Maxton's Spences, and then go to the second slideshow. And uh, that slideshow will also have a compare uh, a lecture video tied to it as well.